gonna basically introduce myself, first of all, um, Dr. Zayas, or Jose Zayas. Um, I'm a first year resident at SVSS, and really glad I'm here today to talk to you guys. I just wanna basically give you guys a little bit of information on how we as a referral practice would like to communicate with you guys via reader raft, okay? I feel like that's one of the main thing or issues when we're trying to get um, information with all of these patients that need our help, okay? A lot of the times we get radar graph, but things are missing or positioning is not adequate, and then we cannot provide a more thorough recommendation for the patient. So getting this done from the beginning um, is something that definitely will benefit you guys and us um, in terms of trying to communicate throughout the whole process, okay? So I'm gonna divide the presentation in two, mainly focusing in forelimb and hindlimb. Um, I know you guys have some emergency um, things going on, so I'll try to be thorough and as short as possible, and we, maybe we can do a, the other half in another day, okay? That's awesome, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. So I just wanted to point out what do you guys think is going on in this rats? Um, any thoughts? Oh, lots of problems. <laughs> right? Right. I see someone's gonna get written up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah. 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 wow. Right. So um, we have to be cognizant. These are rats that we often receive as a referral practice. Um, and this is why I'm here today. Okay. Just to make sure we're preventing this from happening. It's not only you guys are being exposed, okay? Um, you have to be very particularly aware of that, but also there's a lot of things missing here. We don't know what limb are we actually taking a radiograph. Is this the right limb? Is the left limb? What are we actually looking for? Are we actually taking a look at the toes or what are we doing, okay? The toes are even with the hand, so we can't see if there's any sort of um, deformity, fracture, or anything in particular. Uh, in the middle image, there's a lot of exposure or what's called burned out image. Mm -hmm. And even the positioning is not adequate. So <laughs> if you're trying to look at the pelvis or anything in particular, um, we're not being able to provide you more recommendations on that end. And then the, uh, the third view, the same again, the hand. I think we're taking more of an extra of the human hand than the actual patient. So <laughs> wow. uh, making sure we have adequate collimation and things like that, it's, Gonna definitely help you guys. But they have the radiology ring on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Good thing to point out. So, um, the focus today, I will say, will be more for the forelimb. Um, so, we'll discuss a little bit of forelimb anatomy and forelimb joints and radiograph positioning. And if we have time, maybe another day, we can discuss the hind limb. Okay? Awesome. So, tips uh, in regards to what should we be concentrating in. A lot of times these patients are pretty uncomfortable um, when they come to us. They're very lame, so that's why they're coming to you guys with um, some sort of discomfort. So sedation is highly recommended on these patients because when you're trying to pull on their legs, they can be a little bit painful, and that will definitely um, affect the way of your positioning. Um, the use of positioning devices like phone wedges, handbags, ties like cling gauze or even leashes is something that we typically use um, for pulling on limbs. Um, wooden spoon is something always really helpful whenever you have um, ex excess of skin or trying to accommodate the position of the limb. And sometimes even towels are helpful um, to accommodate everything. Really important to protect ourselves at all times um, to prevent us please as less exposure is better. And then really important, like I said, labeling the radiograph, um, signalment, the date, really important, and the positioning. The date is one of the most important things. For example, if a fracture comes in to us, we want to know is this uh, something that happened yesterday, did it happen a month ago, weeks, days, um, which will definitely differentiate the type of treatment that we will recommend. So a little bit of the forelimb anatomy, you probably know, um, most of the bones and shoulder joints, I just wanted to give you a review. We have a couple of bones, mainly the scapula on top, the humerus, radius and ulna, the carpal bones, and the um, phalanges or toes. Then we have from top to bottom, the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, the carpal joint, or carpal and phalangeal joints. Okay. So starting with the shoulder joint, I think a lot of 
patients are being referred to us are because of shoulder um, discomfort. Um, for a shoulder joint specifically, we focus on a lateral and caudal cranial views, more for identification of OCD lesions, fractures, or even bone tumors around that region. Um, and most of them are very painful on uh, home palpation and range of motion, so sedation you, is highly recommended with them. Can you like explain OCD? Because there's we get a lot of people that are not um, yeah that tech. So like if you don't use acronym, I got them first. They they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So it, and this and as you can see, the humeral head crack. So that um white surface is a particular surface of the actual bone, which it slides in the scapula. So an OCD lesion is basically a vascular um, lesion in the bone surface itself. So a lot of times those um, surfaces can actually have necrosis and then they just detach from the actual surface. Oh. And it can be floating in the actual surface uh, and join up the shoulder joint and then we just have to remove it to relieve the comfort. So most of the time what we will recommend would be an arthroscopy, but before even getting a diagnosis, we need some rare graphs. Um, sometimes it can be obvious on x-rays, versus in some of them we will need to do like more advanced imaging like a CT. Okay. So shoulder joint and lateral positioning. Um, I have two basically images here just for reference. You will place a patient in lateral recumbency with the affected side down. Um, and then you will pull the affected limb cranially and ventrally. As you can see in the first picture, you have the limb, the unaffected limb pull caudally and the affected limb pull cranially. And you will collimate or basically focus on the image mainly on the shoulder joint. Okay. So the next view will basically be more or less how to concentrate on what to include in the image. So you, when you're collimating the image, you want to make sure that your center point is the shoulder joint. And you should include at least one fourth of the distal scapula and one fourth of the proximal humerus. Okay. okay. Once again, col collimating. Okay. Collimating. Collimating. Can you explain them what collimating is? Wow. Yeah, so you can see in the upper image, there's like a small square. Um, usually it's being marked by a cross. You, there's usually a light on your radiograph machine. Um, that collimation, or you can adjust that light, okay? You don't want to include more than what you need to prevent scatter radiation, okay? We don't need to include the shafts or cervical region or the neck. You're only focusing on the region that we want to actually be focused on. So in this case, the shoulder. Okay. Thank you. So in this case, no, you're welcome. So the X-ray beam will be more focused on the shoulder, and I actually mentioned the distal scapula and humerus because they're only focuses on the joint. You don't, you're not focusing in this particular um, area in terms of bones. We're actually looking at the joint surface. Most of the time, when you have a OCD lesion, it will be around the back of the portion of the humeral head, okay? Uh, so around here. And you will see like a step down or a flat surface. And usually when the dogs are ambulating, it's actually rubbing on the scapula that will cause a lot of discomfort, okay? So the other view that we recommend for shoulders are the caudal cranial view positioning. So dogs are in dorsal recumbency, you will pull the limbs up, okay? And you can see a little bit better the square I was talking about with the cross. Mm -hmm. You should focus in the cross being on top of the shoulder joint. And again, the landmarks will be the same in terms of the imaging. It's just a different position, okay? Um, again, focusing on the shoulder joint and including those two bones are what we need to actually be able to diagnose a abnormality of the shoulder joint, okay? We have to focus again, we're only taking a look at bone. If there's any soft tissue or ligaments or any tendons being torn, a lot of times we're not going to be able to diagnose that on um, greater graphs. So that's when advanced imaging like a CT or MRI comes from. But before that, we need to rule out things um, in this, with greater graphs are the first thing we will do. So now focusing more on the humerus, um, a little bit more distal to the uh, shoulder joint. 
We usually recommend lateral and cranial views or cranial views, depending on how comfortable the patient is. So we usually use it for identifying fractures, car, um, cancer, or even infection diseases. A lot of times we can have, for example, patients that have valley fever. Um, it's pretty common and endemic in Arizona. You know, even bony changes um, can be identified on radiographs. So. so again, focusing on the lateral view, um, the patient will be placed on the lateral recumbency with the affected side down, and then pretty much the same way we did the shoulder um, positioning, we will pull that affected limb cranial and then the unaffected limb caudal, okay? The collimation will be different. Now we need to include the whole bone. So again, also extending the neck just to prevent superimposition or overlaying of the trachea and cervical structures is important, okay? So this is a view, as you can see, there's definitely a bony lesion around the humerus, which could be potentially a cancerous process. In this case, osteosarcoma in a large group dog is pretty common. Um, and by just taking this view, we can identify that. Um, collimation, again, should include the one fourth of the distal scapula, the shoulder joint, the whole humerus, and then a little bit of the radius and ulna on the bottom. Um, so the next view will be the humerus caudal cranial positioning. So the patient can be placed in dorsal recumbency, and you will extend the legs again um, up and cranially, and the changes will be basically on the collimation. So it's basically the same position you would do for a shoulder, but the, the amount of um, imaging that you're including is a little bit broader. Okay, you have to make sure that the patient remains um, as parallel as possible to the table, just to prevent any sort of distortion in the image, so that way we can actually see what we wanna see. Um, as you can see here, it's a perfectly straight view of the humerus. You can, you're including the scapula, you're including the, the, also the proximal um, radius and ulna um, for the image, and it looks everything perfectly but there's something missing on this one. No what right or left. Exactly. So if you send me this, I will contact you and be like, okay, what what are, limb are we talking about? Okay. That could differentiate what I'm seeing on physical exam versus what you saw on physical exam and radiographs. Okay. So some patients may be a little bit uncomfortable when you extend cranially. So another thing we can do is pull the limb down um, and do another type of view, which is a cranial caudal view. When I'm mentioning cranial caudal, cranial caudal, all those things is how the actually the X-ray beam is coming from. Okay, so in a cranial caudal view, it's coming from the cranial aspect of the actual humerus and coming back. Okay, um, so the patient again is placing dorsal recumbency with the affected limb extended caudally. Okay. Um, and the plane of the humerus is should be parallel to the tabletop. Again, this will help us um, prevent any sort of distortion. The affected forelimb should be also abducted slightly away from the thorax. That way, we're preventing any superimposition with the chest. Sometimes, if there's any sort of small fracture and it's over the chest, we're not going to be able to identify it. Okay. So as you can see here, the rest of the body and the image is basically away from the focus that we want to. And again, the same collimation to include those structures again. So now the elbow, it's another type of structure that we actually like to focus on. Uh, a lot of times we see now with the number one braid in America being the Frenchies, those can fracture the elbows pretty often. We see a lot of them, I'll say maybe one or two weekly that we need to fix. So this is something that will definitely be helpful for you guys. Um, for elbow positioning, we, depending on the clinician and doctor you work with, they may want a 45 or 90 degree flex lateral um, position or cranial caudal view. Um, and this will help us evaluate for fractures or even elbow dysplasia, which is a pretty common thing we see in large breed dogs. Um, and some supplementary views with hyperflex lateral to for um, identify on the United and colonial process, which is 
a component of elbow dysplasia. It's often recommended, from, but from your perspective and from a GP scanning point, we want to keep it as basic as possible. These are more advanced um, positions that if we think it's needed, we will perform them, okay? We just wanted to mention them. So with the elbow positioning and the lateral positioning, why uh, you place the, again, the patient, a lot of the times will be in lateral recumbency with the, mostly the affected side close to the table. Um, and then the unaffected side can be either moved cranially on call or caudally, depending how the patient tolerates it. Uh, a lot of the times it can be a little bit uncomfortable. Again, sedation will be really helpful for them. And the flexion of 45 or 90 degrees, it will just be case dependent. Sometimes you can see things on a 45 degrees, you may need to retake it again on 90 degrees uh, in order to actually see what you want to uh, assess. So in terms of the lateral view, again, the x-ray beam should be aiming towards the um, joint itself, the elbow joint, and focusing on the media epicondyle. So the media epicondyle, it's mostly this region around here, okay? The elbow has two epicondyles on each side, and this, in this way you're aiming from the medial side to the lateral side of the um, arm of the dog, okay? You should include at least one-fourth of the humerus and then one-fourth of the proximal antebrachium or the radius and ulna. And the superimposition of epicondyles should be something that you should address and make sure it's present to make sure it's an actual lateral view, okay? The elbow joint craniocaudal positioning will be the second position we want to see for elbows. Um, patients usually place in sternal recumbency with the affected more than fully extended, okay? And the patient head again should be turned away from the affected side. This way we can prevent again superimposition of the trachea um, and structures in the neck that we can basically superimpose them um, and be able to um, not find what we're looking for, okay? Um, the humerus, elbow joint, radius, and ulna should be aligned. So just focusing on the whole limb itself with the table in order to actually have a true craniocaudal view. If the elbow is not able to be fully extended, some clinics may have the ability of angle the radiograph um, positioning. Um, and sometimes you can angle it a little bit in terms of specifics around 10 to 20 degrees. Um, it should be helpful to identify any abnormalities in the radius, okay? So again, we can take a look at this view. Um, we have on the right side, more or less on the focusing on what we include in the x-rays. And then the two circles are pointing at the epicondyles I was mentioning in the previous x-rays. If, if you didn't see, if you see both like prominences in a lateral view, you need to retake them to actually be able to I don't have a perfect lateral view for the elbow wise. So the boundaries again, the medial epicondyle with the x-ray being um, perfectly aligned with the joint or the orifice in the middle, okay? And the collimation should include again the distal humerus and the proximal antithracheum. So the next step will be the radius and ulna. All of the time we oftenly see, I will say greyhound, small breed dogs with radius and ulna fractures, and positioning for these are really important to actually be able to provide an adequate assessment. This is the multiple fragment fractures, the only simple fracture, um, and even bony lesions of the bone tumor can also be identified with this one, okay? So the patients, again, place in lot of recumbency. It's pretty much repairable, again, every time we want to make um, a view, we place the patient in a lateral view um, on top of the table with the affected side down. In this case, you will slightly flex the elbow and pull on the radius and ulna a little bit forward or cranially, and the unaffected limb you want it out of the view, so you pull it back, okay? So in this image, you can see a perfect lateral view. We're including the elbow joint, the radius and ulna, same as the carpus in the bottom, okay? Um, we can see the whole, both bones with no superimposition of any other structures. The second view will be the cranial caudal view, so image from top, 
Um, so you will place a patient in sternal recumbency again, and you will fully extend the whole limb, and then the head should be turned away just to prevent that superimposition. This is a, it's a view from a cranial caudal or from top, uh, which you can see all the structures very really important. You can see the radius on top and the ulna on the side. Okay, it's really important for us to see this view to make sure that we're not missing any other abnormality. So, collimation is pretty much the same as a lateral view um, that we'll like in terms of the structures included. So the last portion I will say in terms of the forelimb, it's mainly the carpus and the toes or mass in terms of a Latin um, perspective. And for the carpus, we likely um, use a dorsal palmar or from top to bottom view and lateral views. And the same for metacarpal and digit. So again, from a perspective standpoint, we're looking at the wrist uh, of dog. So these are the carpal bones here. We're talking about the metacarpal bones, and after the metacarpal bones, we have the phalanges. So each each toe has three um, from top to bottom. So P1, P2, um, P1, P2, P3. Um, the nail being the P3. Okay. So carpus and lateral positioning. Um, again, lateral recumbency with the effect is side down. Um, you need to collimate just over the carpus um, and focusing mainly on what we want to see. You don't have to collimate all the way up to the radius and ulna. We don't need that in the image. It's really important for doctors to be able to tell you guys from a technician standpoint, where are we focusing on? Um, and based on their physical exam, where's the actual luminous and painful and discomfort is, okay? We don't want to include more than what we actually need. So. From a lateral view, you can see on perfectly fine all the carpal bones and metacarpal bones and the lateral aspect, and a little bit of the radius and ulna. Sometimes we can have um, lesions of the articular surface around this region that can be a little bit uncomfortable. We can identify fractures if they're present on this um, way, um, same as metacarpal fractures on this side. Okay. Again, what's wrong with this view? Correct. So communication in terms of how we position these and also identifying if it's a right or left, um, it's really important for you guys. So the next view, dorsal palmar. So we can have it here, pity, really cute. Taking a view from top to bottom, just focusing on the carpus and metacarpal region. Um, so we'll have to fully extend the whole limb um, sometimes you can add the string gauze or a leash to actually pull in the limb. Sometimes it can be a little bit in the way of the x-ray, but it's actually helpful when you're trying to prevent to have exposure yourself. Um, so having a little bit of string gauze around attached to this region here and then pull back, that's definitely going to help you guys get that view. So again, perfect view. Um, or my dorsal palmar view. Collimation should include the one third of this distal radius and ulna, the carpal bones, you can see all of them, and the metacarpal bones, okay? We're not focusing on the digits, so that's why we don't include the nails in this view. So it's really important for you guys, again, to make sure what are we focusing on? Is it the carpus, is it the, is it the toes, uh, in order to take an appropriate radiograph, okay? Um, so the metacarpus and digits in the lateral positioning, now we have to lower a little bit more of the collimation. Same positioning we have previously been mentioning, the effect is sideways down to the table. We will slightly flex the elbow um, and move the radius and ulna cranially, and then the unaffected limb, you can pull it back or caudally, okay? So you can see here, now we're included everything, the toes, the metacarpus, the carpus, and a little bit of the radius and ulna just to make sure we're not missing anything on the distal for them, okay? Um, and then the second move would be the dorsal palmar, or again, from top to bottom. Um, the patient will be placed in center of recumbency, you will scan the whole limb, and then again, shift the head a little bit so it's on the way of the view, and collimate only what you need, 
Now, you don't need in this case a whole radius and ulna or elbow, just focus on the distal part. Um, and again, we should include the x-ray beam centered with the carpus, uh, and we should include the carpal bone, joint, the metacarpal bones and digits, okay? Um, and that should conclude the forelimb, okay? Do you have any questions for me, any doubts or anything that you may want to talk about? On that last picture with the dog, I saw you have like something over the dog. Is that something we should have? Um, is that just a weight? Is so that a weight? This, yeah. is that that one? Yeah, so in this view, it's, the patient is sedated. So you want to prevent as much as possible that he cannot move. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of times, mm -hmm. so this patient was sedated for the view. So uh -huh. in order to make sure they're still sedated, but they can still move in the x-ray table. So, so just to prevent it from actually shifting when you're taking the x-rays, sometimes you can just be away from the table and just pull on the leg, but no one's holding the, the actual patient. So just for preventing any shifting, you can use sandbags, you can actually use tape to actually go over the patient and get it to the table, that will definitely fix the patient in place to prevent any movement and distortion. So it's not to prevent radiation? No, no, no. Okay. Like I said, what will prevent radiation or scatter is how you collimate. So in this view, you can see the collimation being only focused on the carpus. Oh, the light. Yeah, so the, the light, this little box, box correct. Okay. So that will prevent it more scatter or more radiation to the rest of the patient. So it's not only helping the patient having less exposure, it's also helping you guys um, being more um, safety wise. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any more questions? I don't know if you guys want to do the if rest. If have time, we do have the um, Heidelin radiographs as well, if you want to go over that. Honestly, I, you know, I think we can keep going. Okay, perfect. Okay. Perfect. So, Heidelin anatomy-wise, again, we have multiple bones um, present in this area. I will say, as a referral practice, we see a lot of both of forelimb lameness and hindlimb lameness, but I don't know how you guys feel in terms of your um, patient-wise, how they present to you guys. What is the most common injury that you guys see on a hind limb? Stead, right? Yeah. And what kind of injury? Yep. Right? Okay. So I will say that's the most common surgery we do as a surgeon. I will say it's a bread and butter for us, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we usually do one to three surgeries per day. Um, it's a pretty straightforward surgery for us, but before surgery and all planning, we need to make sure we're having adequate x-rays for one, planning, and two, be able to diagnose it based on x-rays. A lot of the times we can actually diagnose it just on physical exam, but some cases are, do not read the book, and we just have to look for changes in the x-ray that will indicate evidence of a crucial disease, for example, okay? So, the focus on, on the presentation on this half, it's mainly on multiple sides of the hind limb um, and basically every joint that we have, okay? So again, we have multiple bones, the pelvis, the femur, the tibia, fibula, tarsal bones, metatarsals, and all these joints are really important for the dogs to be able to handle it, okay? So a little bit of the pelvis. Um, for pelvis positioning, we usually like a ventral dorsal in lateral views. Um, and this will help us a lot with identifying fractures, hip dyslalia is something that we commonly see as a referral practice to just make recommendations in terms of treatment, surgically, or even medical management. Um, hip luxations after being hit by car or having a traumatic event, um, having x-rays is really helpful, not only on elevation, because that will differentiate the type of treatment that we do, the way that they look safe, okay? Um, as well as sector elect location, so just focusing on this region here. So this will be the ilium of the pelvis. This is the sacrum that we're looking for. 
a lot of times if we have like a hit by your car, a pretty bad traumatic event, this bone here can ship a little bit upward or downward with respect to this joint here in between. And that will require a lot of the time surgical fixation, okay? But in order to actually be able to diagnose that, we need x-rays, okay? So for a pelvis, I'm pretty sure you guys have done this before, but just, just giving you a little bit more detailed information on what to do. Um, we were going to do a lateral recumbency with the affected side that the dog is laying on with the side down the table and then the chest and abdomen in a true lateral positioning. So sometimes it can be a little bit shifted and that will definitely change how lateral or not the view that we're actually seeing is actually um, appropriately aligned. The bottom of the fever should be a slightly cranial and flex. Um, in this view and the image on top, you can see that we're placing a sandbag in between the legs. And the whole reasoning for this is because one, we're trying to prevent that bottom leg from moving. And two, you want to prevent the other leg to actually be able to have a lot of pressure sore on the actual table. This patient can be 120 pound Great Dane, and then they're putting the whole body weight on a flat surface. So you want to make sure that they're comfortable as possible, even though they're sedated. Okay, so positioning wedges with um, foam wedges or sandbags may be helpful whenever you're trying to do this little position. Um, so in lateral view, you're focusing mainly on including this landmark. So your beam or x-ray beam should be focused on the greater trochanter of the femur. So it's this region here, okay? Um, you should include the, uh, in the dorsal margin of this region in here the cranial and dorsal aspect of the wing of the ilium. And on the back or caudal margin, you should include the ischium, which is this region here of the pelvis, okay? You can see in this aspect in here that there's superimposition of the ischium. So in the other view, in terms of the anatomy, we're talking about these two regions in here. Well, these two regions in here. So they should be superimposed. We shouldn't be seeing two sides um, to, in order to have a true lateral positioning. So you can see all the structures that you need to see. If this was like, a, for example, a luxation, this femur can be all the way here versus all the way down here. Um, and that would differentiate the type of surgical or non-surgical treatment okay, for the patient. And the ventral dorsal view, so the second view for the pelvis, really important. Most of the time it's a two-person job. Uh, you can put the patient on, on a tray. A lot of dogs can have back pain, so you want to make sure that they're not flat on the table um, just to prevent discomfort, even though they can be sedated. Um, their head and, and should be against the shoulders um, for a little bit mildly extended. Again, we're not focusing on the forelimbs or shafts but it's definitely going to help you align the spine and the sternum and this will, will help you be able to differentiate between um, am I straight or not with respect to the pelvis. So the sternum and the back spine with respect to the pelvis is definitely going to help you when you're trying to position them. Um, so one person on, around the head, another person on the back just pulling on the limbs, so just grasping the tarsus you will flex the knees a um, little bit and then pull against um, towards you um, with equal traction. That way we're having equal um, symmetry throughout the whole thing. So just a little bit of perspective. We have a view on, on the left of what we would like to be seeing on a normal dog. So you're focusing the x-ray beam on the pubis, so around this region in here, okay? And you should include the wing of the ilium on top, the caudal edge of the stifle, so around this region, and both femurs also. If the patient is too big, so sometimes the x-ray table is not enough for a 150 pound Great Dane, um, as long as you can include the pelvis and a little bit of the um, femur, that could be enough for us to actually be able to identify any pelvic abnormalities. Okay. So, in this um, image, you can definitely see a normal 
um, pelvis versus an abnormal pelvis in this case, um, we are having evidence of hip dysplasia or and also subluxation of both femurs. So this patient, um, depending on the age and state of their life, there can be potentially a lot of different treatments that we can do for them. Surgically speaking, um, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of a total hip replacement. Um, that's an advanced type of surgery that we offer in our practice. And dogs that have hip dysplasia on an early age um, being diagnosed throughout their life is something that we usually recommend for them. If it's a 12 year old dog that mainly stays at home, doesn't move too much, then medical management will be the, more of the case recommendation. But in a young dog that has hip dysplasia, a lot of the time surgical um, treatment is recommended, okay? How often do you do FHOs? If it shows if it's just client dependent, um, I think a total hip replacement requires a lot from the owner, okay? Um, from the different perspectives, one, finances, and two, make sure that they're comfortable taking care of the patient in the post-op period. It's a long process, okay? It takes about 12 weeks of recovery for those patients, and even sometimes more complications can happen. Um, and making sure that the owners are aware of or all the pros and cons of moving forward with that type of surgery is something. Compared to a femoral head osteotomy or an FHO, the function of the hip joint is a little bit different. So we're looking around 95% back to almost completely functional hip joint versus a femoral head osteotomy, you're losing that ball and socket joint. So it's more of a synsarcosis or more of a, more of a fibrotic tissue around where it was the joint to actually be able to help the dog move around. Some dogs do pretty well, some dogs don't do well. A lot of the times that will require extensive um, recovery and rehab in order to have a functional limb, okay? So I feel it's more of a one, client compliance to identification of a perfect patient. Also, if the patient is too crazy, like moves too much, too active, something to consider if it's actually a perfect patient or candidate for the um, type of um, replacement perspective. And also, any other comorbidities, are we looking into, does the dog have any other lamenesses in the front limb or the other limb? Um, and the most important of all, finances, okay? A lot, of pay, a lot of owners may not be able to afford that, okay? A total hip replacement, we're talking about eight to $10,000 in terms of um, payment. Um, is that something that you guys would like to do or not? Something that we often have an extensive communication with them okay, prior to moving forward. Um, so, any questions that I can answer? Yeah. Okay. So, this other view here is really important for us because a lot of times we can see fractures on the head of the femur, okay? What it's called a capital visier fractures. And sometimes in just a lateral view or a or, um, ventral view, we're not able to identify. So we need to move those femurs a little bit to be able to see if there's any shipment on those fragments, okay? A lot of the times, this will give us a confirmatory diagnosis. We usually see it in young dogs because it's a more of a immature growth plate um, problem than anything else, and they can just be running outside and they just fracture it in their lane, okay? And with just this, this type of radiograph, we're gonna be able to identify that. Um, again, it's a two-person job. Sometimes if the patient is really sedated, you don't need too many people, uh, and you can just use, for example, leashes or plain gauze to accommodate for the positioning. The patient will be in dorsal recumbency, a V tray or sandbags should be enough to actually be, make sure the patient is aligned with the table. And the femur should be at a little bit about 45 degrees angle with respect to the spine. So you can see from the top, more or less how we would like to have the legs positioned and from a lateral view. And then on a real patient, how will it look like? Collimation again, straight down, concentrating on the pubis. And this is how the view should look like, okay? 
in order to make sure it's an actual perfect frog leg view, um, symmetry on this um, forming foramens in here, called the operator foramens, uh, will be present. Okay. Uh, as well as symmetry with the both wing of the aliens on both sides. Oh, sorry. Um, femur wise, we usually recommend to do a lateral and a craniocaudal view for identification of tumors, any infectious diseases, or even fractures that we commonly see. Um, in the lateral recumbent C wise, we put the affected side down um, and then we collimate in order to include the whole femur and a little bit of the sideboard joint and the hip joint. Okay. On the lateral view, you can see the structure that I just mentioned. So we have the hip joint on top, the stifle joint on the bottom, and the whole shaft of the femur in the middle of the image. Um, really important to try to like remove that other limb from the view. Sometimes it can be superimposed um, and we can be missing fractures or even um, a cruise ship, for example, can be superimposed over each other and then we can misdiagnose it, okay? Um, so from a stifle and tibia perspective, a lot of the times we recommend to do a TPLO view, okay? I heard around that you guys have someone that comes in and do some sort of unbone procedures with you guys with some patients. Uh, as a referral practice, again, we get a lot of cruciate ligament tears with patients on that will need a TPL surgery, okay? But also we will get the patients that have TBL fractures um, around the joint or even the shaft of the, uh, of the tibia. We will oftenly do the same sort of positioning in terms of radiographs. It's only two views, something that you can do, and we will be able to tell you what's going on um, by just a phone call, okay? So, Put it into perspective, again, the patient will be placed on lateral recumbency with the affected side down, and you will have a flexion of the knee and tarsus in a 90, position, 90 degree positioning. So an L-shaped positioning with respect to the table. Sometimes you may need to put like a foam or something at the bottom or near the tarsus, just to make sure that limb is not angled, okay? That may change one, some measurements that are really important for the surgery perspective. Um, so when you're changing the angle with respect to the actual beam, that can change the um, measurements, okay? So having a straight um, lateral view, and also um, if you have any sort of measurement, measurement um, devices that you can include in the image is actually helpful. Um, the same with the making sure you're actually saying it's just a right or a left on them. Okay. So in this view, um, perfect lateral view of a TPLO. So you can have, you're seeing a 90 um, degree perspective on the tarsus and almost 90 um, degree perspective on the stifle. You can see a little bit of whiteness or radio opaque um, changes on the stifle joint. Those are changes um, more related to stifle effusion and that's more one of the most common things we look for on this image for diagnosis of a cruciate tear, okay? Um, so including, again, the stifle joint will be your center of the x-ray beam. You need to include the distal femur on the tarsus and metatarsus. In order to actually make sure you have a true lateral view uh, of a tibialo image, the condyles of both um, in the femur should be superimposed. You, sh you shouldn't be seeing two of them in the image. If so, um, if you can take a re um, redo the x-ray, that would be great. That way, um, we're actually having a lateral view that will help us with positioning um, in terms of surgery or implant um, planning. So the other view will be a cranial caudal view. A lot of dogs, in terms of cranial crucial ligament tears, can be pretty uncomfortable, more on hyper extension of the knee. So this view might be a little bit uncomfortable. So a lot of the times if you can and the patient is unable to do so without sedation, sedation will be recommended. Okay. Um, again, you'll place the patient on the surgery on the tabletop and center recumbency and then 
pull the effect of the pod away. Um, and then the other lane, you can see it's out of the view, just to make sure it's not superimposing, okay? The other leg, you can put it under over a foam or a sandbag, just to prevent discomfort on that other side, that's having con um, continuous contact with the table. So again, a view of the caudal cranial view on a perfect perspective for a TPLO, you would include the stifle joint, the tibia is straight with respect to the tarsus and stifle, and you're including everything. Um, the, femur, the femur and the tibia slash fibula should be aligned in parallel to the x-ray table, and that way you're gonna make sure that you're actually having a true caudal cranial view. Um, and then the last portion of the hind limb will be the tarsus, metatarsus, and digit, digits. So we're talking about this region here will be the tarsal, tarsal joints, okay? The bottom will be the, me the metatarsus in comparison to the forelimb, which are called the um, carpal bones or the um, carpal joints, and then the digits, okay? And then the metacarpals also, sorry. So you will have a dorsal plantar or view from top to bottom and lateral views. This will help us a lot of times to identify any sort of joint disease, infectious or even fractures of the ankle, okay? Um, some views may be helpful, um, like flexion, oblique, and stress views, um, but that, those will be more recommended depending on the injury if we're not able to identify something pretty obvious on this two views. Sorry. So again, um, a lot of the times these patients are pretty uncomfortable. I will say the more distal in the limb the injury is, the more painful the dogs are, and they're more, like I will say, non-weight bearing. I will say a dog is, it will be non-weight bearing if it has a fracture in the toe versus something going on in the hip, okay? Um, we see that a lot of times. So they often require sedation, just trying to accommodate what we would like to do and position them on the water recumbency. Um, the effective pelvic limb should be pulled a little bit distal um, to make sure it's in neutral position and should be perpendicular to the body, not pulled cranially or caudally. And then the unaffected limb should be uh, abducted or turned away, like in this um, image in here, just to make sure, again, we're not having superimposition. The collimation, again, is really important, we're only focusing on the ankle measure parses and the digits um, for this view. So here you have a perfect lateral view of the tarsus. Again, make sure the collimation includes the tarsal bones, metatarsals, and the um, toes and nails in the actual image to be able to identify any sort of um, bone fractures that um, the patient has. And then the last view will be the dorsal panther view or and then the patient will be placed in dorsal recumbency. The B-tray should be a lot of times useful, and then you will grasp the tarsus, or even sometimes you can put um, some tape or leash or plain gauze, just make it easier for you guys to pull. Um, and then you should make sure the stifle or knee joint is aligned in parallel to the tabletop, and as well as the tarsus. Um, this will definitely prevent some image distortion um, in some cases. So you can see here, perfect um, dorsal plantar view. Again, making sure that your x-ray beam is mainly centered around this region, including the mandotarsals and the digits, okay? And again, I don't know which side is this side, if it's a right or a left, because there was no marker, okay? <laughs> so in this image, there's no broken toe. So this in here, this line in here, it's actually the paw pad. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's really important for you guys to identify. Um, a lot of times that can be misdiagnosed as a paw pad rather than actually a, a fracture. Okay. So just a little bit of review, just making sure that you at least have two views for any anatomical region that you would like to focus on center the x-ray beam um, over the area that you mostly are interested um, and visualize how the image will look on the monitor and move the patient 
um, where you actually like to want it um, for the area of interest along the axis or the collimation field rather than actually rotating the collimation. So just making sure everything is centered. Um, collimate the area of interest. So don't include more than what you actually need. That will help one the patient and you guys in terms of more exposure to radiation. And this also improve um, image quality. It's like taking a picture with zoom rather than just a whole place in here. But I wanted to take a picture of you only. I would just zoom, right? right. Instead of just taking the whole the big, room. Yeah. Okay, right. so the collimation is more of a zooming perspective than anything else. And again, just be protect yourself, use gloves, use um, all your um, radiation safety equipment just to prevent um, exposure, okay. Any questions? I know it's a lot of information um, to gather. I will definitely send you guys all this slide so you guys can have it just for um, further um, positioning questions if you guys have, you just have them on hand if you have anything. You can always call us, we're only a phone call away. If you have any questions, uh, we will definitely be able to help you guys when you're taking this x-rays, okay? Any questions? Well, thank you for having me here today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to give you guys this presentation. And thank you. Thank you.